Yes, perhaps I should tell you a few words. So, uh, I, well, I'm very happy to be here once more. And uh, many thanks for my friend David, who has, now he doesn't need to insist to bring me over because I like it coming. So it's okay. Thank you very much, David. And uh, thank you, of course, always Fidel. So they're taking pictures. Uh, Yes, uh, for the first time I'm going to talk about something where uh, there is no innovation. That's very exceptional. <laughs> Usually whenever I have a title there is innovation somewhere. But you will see, it's implicit in the way in things I'm going to say. But uh, basically also uh, it, it is a joint work which I did with my friend uh, who is a uh, from Tunisia, from the uh, Manuba University, uh, Abdelnasser Marf, whom you haven't met. Uh, and uh, he's more uh, the specialist of uh, joint ventures than me, but we thought we will bring our knowledge together. Uh, my knowledge on the issues of transfer and his knowledge on the issues of joint ventures. And hopefully, try to bring something out of this marriage, if I may say so. But perhaps who, uh, people who don't know what Globalix is, I may just say a few words. You may have seen Globalix somewhere. Uh, indeed, Globalix, as you can see, is a global network on the, of the, uh, on the economics of learning, innovation, competence building systems. Uh, you can easily go to the website, but uh, briefly, it's a worldwide research network which has now 15 years old of age because the last uh, conference in Athens where we met, David and myself, uh, was the 15th conference. And uh, it is uh, composed now roughly 2,000 or thereabout, a little more than 2,000 scholars from all over the world, as it mentioned, the global network. Um, participating scholars are economists basically, but not only economists, they are also social scientists, political scientists, people from uh, history, from the management, from political science and others. Uh, we have the ambition to look at the innovation and competence building, uh, specifically uh, towards the uh, issues of the problematics of developing countries and uh, uh, how innovation and competence building can contribute to uh, economic and sustainable development, and sustainable and inclusive, inclusive development. Um, it has, uh, of course, uh, uh, done many things, conferences, yearly conferences, from next year, it will be every second year. It has gone all over the world, 15 uh, countries now, 14 countries or so. The next conference will be in Ghana. And uh, one of the things is that you have a chance when the call is out, and I will encourage you to perhaps to submit some paper, because there are also junior researchers who are encouraged to join the network. So uh, why not? But basically, it is really geared towards doctoral students who are preparing the PhDs. But possibly keep it in mind so that next year, hopefully, when you start your doctoral thesis, then you may be able to join either the conference or what we call the academic uh, network. Uh, Globalix has also uh, acad uh, PhD academies, which are uh, a way of bringing together doctoral students and with uh, eminent professors uh, to for two weeks to uh, discuss, to go in depth into methodology, into concepts, into issues, and also uh, some kind of supervision within those academies. So uh, this might be uh, something of use to you, and I would uh, really encourage you to look into that direction because it is regularly held either in Europe or Latin America or Africa or Asia. And uh, the beauty of it, it is all funded by Globalix. So if you have a chance to be selected, 
then you will be able to present, to join the academy and to present your work. In Latin America, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, uh, David. Yeah, you see, some of uh, one of the former students is really doing marvelous jobs in Rio because the headquarters uh, have moved from Alborg in Denmark to Rio uh, this year, and they are running it from Rio, and it will be there moving around uh, every four years uh, from one country, specifically, uh, particularly if it is one of the southern countries to the other. Anyhow, whatever uh, you would like to ask, is preferably to go to globalix.org to see what all the various things we do. But of course, you can also ask me while I'm here <laughs> if, I, uh, if I have the questions for you. Normally, I should, because I've been in that network as a researcher, better member of the scientific board, vice president, and now member of the Constitution Board, which is the highest body of... <laughs> so, normally I should know everything, but that's not true. <laughs> okay, so do ask me either now or later, or oh, by mail, of course. Uh, second thing is just... The, um, okay, as I said, scientific, contribute to scientific capacity building, uh, all knowledge base for strategies for linking innovation economic development, this is an important thing, platform for north, south, and south, north, south, south, north, and south, south, and the PhD students. Few words of the MacTech network, as you mentioned it, and it is also on the, on the paper. Well, it's a network of scholars, very briefly, from Europe and the Maghreb, research, uh, who research, who are interested in doing research on science, technology, innovation, development, more or less exactly at the same as GlobalX, but is doing it on a, a, a sm much smaller scale on the Mediterranean region. Uh, now more than 400 members, essentially PhD students and junior researchers. Uh, it uh, started in 1995, so it's older than GlobalX, but joined the GlobalX to become a, a member of the network. About 20 books and tens of articles. We have a mobility program, 15 international conferences, and the secretariat is at the University of Lille. Here again, if you are interested in knowing more about this regional network, uh, please go and have a look. And uh, in fact, GlobalX initially was supposed to be the network of the networks, uh, joining ma various networks in a major network. This is the idea, and this is how we joined uh, GlobalX back in 2002. Okay, back now to uh, our um, work. So basically, as I said, uh, the idea is to join two different problematics uh, and to see uh, whether we can tackle an important issue, which is joint ventures, uh, which is a key issue now that uh, there are many, uh, Afri many uh, countries in the south are trying to div diversify their economies, but they, uh, as you well know, they cannot do it on by themselves. They still have to rely on the contributions from uh, foreign companies, more advanced in technology, in management, in various skills, and uh, so it's very timely uh, to talk about joint ventures, although the topic has been around for so many years, but yet we think we still don't know uh, uh, sufficiently what's going on within the joint venture. So I, I start with a few uh, artifacts, uh, very rough as they <coughs> say. We basically more than 500, 5,000, sorry, joint ventures and many uh, more contractual alliances. Uh, in the last five years have been launched. Um, uh, the largest 100 joint ventures represent more than $350 billion in a combined annual income. So it's huge income in joint ventures. It is becoming a popular tool for managing risk in uncertain markets because it 
helps to uh, share the cost in large scale capital investment. One of the reasons, of course, we'll see the others. And injecting a newfound entrepreneurial spirit in maturing businesses. This is also one of the reasons. Uh, some of the top worldwide known uh, joint ventures, Cosmotech, Sony Ericsson, Siemens Nokia, Cadbury Shabs, and others. Uh, many. And some of these have actually been ranked as the top 10 most important joint ventures uh, uh, in the world, uh, in the recent uh, ranking. Yet, uh, several have studies have been made over the last 10 years or so, and uh, more or less they all came out with similar conclusions that not all, uh, all joint ventures are successful 100%. There are many joint ventures which cannot make it, cannot complete or achieve the objectives because they meet several uh, difficulties and, of course, uh, go into bankruptcy and disappear. So, as you see, it's still, although it is very attractive, way of doing business, it is also a very risky because you have one out of two uh, chances to, to fail. And uh, some of the problems uh, highlighted, a uh, variety of problems, in fact most of the work done on joint ventures was about problems met by joint ventures. Difficulty in maintaining strategic uh, alignment because you have two entities we ha which have different strategies and they are trying to work together on a different entity, so alignment of strategies is difficult. Governance systems, uh, of the governance of the whole system. A joint venture is a different system from the parent and from the affiliate. Economic interdependencies, of course, uh, the in terms of costs, in some price, in terms of all economic entities and uh, building the organization, you know, solid grounds, some of the, the problems. And uh, if we look at uh, the developing world, they're also uh, meeting several problems. And the reason why we are looking at the, the topic is because joint ventures in the South are, are also meeting several difficulties. And of course, but they still uh, present uh, interesting prospects. First of all, uh, 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 motivation for going into <coughs> joint ventures in the developing world, uh, from a developed country perspective, of course. Um, joint ventures have always been uh, put out as a solution to some of the obstacles met when you want to invest in a developing country. Uh, FDI, as you know, foreign direct investment is the prefer preferred way of doing things, but FDI is not always possible because of a variety of reasons, the environment, restrictions, and so on. So, uh, joint ventures um, are uh, one, this one uh, way of uh, overcoming some of the restrictions, government restrictions. There are some countries which have rules preventing foreign direct investment or imposing joint ventures as the sole way of doing business with that country. So uh, this is uh, one of the uh, motivation, one of the reasons why you go into uh, joint ventures with the South. Cost and risk sharing, this is traditional. But if you don't know the environment, then risk sharing, risk becomes important. Uh, lack of country familiarity, we will go into this in more depth later. Uh, often when you move into a new market, as you well know, uh, you don't always have all the information, how the market works, how it is structured, how uh, it is uh, functioning in terms of resources, in terms of funding, etc. Ability to navigate through government bureaucracies, and that's, this is one important issue. Because when you invest in a uh, different country, it is already complex. When you invest in a developing country, you are, of course, going to uh, meet all the problems which the companies of that country suffer from. And some of the biggest uh, uh, problems are bureaucracies. Difficult with the, uh, or the rules 
of the uh, requirements of the rules and regulations. Not only there are rules and regulations, but rules and regulations which keep moving quickly over time. In other words, whenever you have uh, acquired some understanding of how the rules work, by the time you start investing, uh, it, it has already changed. So the instability of rules is also one of the major problems met. Existing, pro uh, and also on the positive side, existing and distribution facilities which makes it uh, attractive. Uh, of course, motivation of developing countries are different. Uh, we will see them again. Access to technology often, where well, there were some various surveys made uh, amongst uh, countries from the south to see why, why would you go into a joint venture. So there are some themes which come again and again. Access to technology is one of the important uh, themes. Access to management know-how, which is more or less the same thing, because technology can be also understood in broad sense to include management. Okay, uh, access to export. Uh, sometimes the the only way or prospect to export is to go through joint venture, because here you have also all the knowledge related to how to export, which is brought by the partner, uh, etc. And many uh, joint ventures again uh, enter into uh, difficulties in the south, more or less the same same rate, and depends from one country to the other. In some countries, the joint ventures work rather well. In others, they can run in uh, severe difficulties and within relatively uh, short time, within one year or two. So, uh, oops. Uh, our uh, work here looks specifically at uh, joint venture between developed and developing companies. Uh, we have chosen to look on transfer of technology in a broad sense uh, from developed from the south, north to the south, and uh, creation of a joint venture between partners usually involve for of a need for transfer of technology, know-how, information, and knowledge. And amongst all this, what seems to us uh, an important uh, issue for sustainable growth is not technology in terms of equipment because the equipment, you can require them, but they can go obsolete. You can also uh, renew them, or you may not be able to renew them. Whereas what is the hard issue is uh, uh, it is the uh, knowledge transfer. What is of interest to us, how knowledge flows from the northern part or for the northern countries to the southern countries. The knowledge flows takes place within a joint venture because this is something which has uh, been uh, rather overlooked. We tend to uh, concentrate on the flow of equipment, flow of finance. Often the analysis which exists are equipment, finance, facilities, utilities. But very little is done on the knowledge flow. And yet the knowledge flow is one of the key elements for successful joint venture. In other words, if the knowledge is not flowing in the way it should, then the joint venture, no matter how, fund, how fin, uh, wealthy it has, uh, no matter what the access to funding is, how important it is, no matter how uh, uh, important in terms of equipment flow, uh, it probably will be uh, failing. And because in that knowledge flow, eh bien, uh, there is a learning experience and learning is also, when you talk about knowledge, you talk about learning. Both are interlinked, within which the innovation and competence take place. Um, so uh, learning, as you know, is now the key word, which is at the basis of growth. And we are talking about the learning economy, referring to my friend uh, Van Tuke Lundval, the, the last uh, book, Learning Economy and Economics of Hope, if you want to read it. Uh, so we are in the process of learning. So interav interactive uh, logic of knowledge transfer. Uh, but uh, the other thing is it's not unidirectional because we tend to think that knowledge is transferred uh, from the south to the north. And uh, our hypothesis 
our uh, proposal is not, that's not true. Knowledge uh, flows from the north to the south and from the south to the north. And the learning experience in, is in both ways. The south is learning from the north and the north is learning from the south. So this is the added value which we are hoping to bring, saying that uh, uh, to be successful, it is the whole flow of knowledge which has to be taken into account and not only unidirectional flow of knowledge. So, uh, our problematics, the transfer of knowledge in joint venture is a complex relationship uh, between parent company and the joint venture. As And briefly, joint venture has basically two main actors. It's the parent company, which is the leader of the uh, joint venture, who is the initiator sometimes of the joint venture, and the uh, joint venture itself, which is the local company formed uh, in the process and strategic way to, uh, to enter into this association. So uh, the interactive knowledge, uh, logic of knowledge transfer uh, predominates, as you say, for the foreign uh, parent firm. But we added uh, a, li a little uh, difficulty because uh, we tend to think that the, the joint venture setup is only between the ca parent company and the joint venture itself. In fact, uh, by looking, by observation, reading also, we discovered that this triangular relationship, it was between the parent company, between the local parent company, and between the joint venture. So instead of having dyadic relationship between the two actors, we have in fact three relations. We have three actors, the parent company, international com parent company, the local parent company, and the joint venture. And if we look at it in this triangular aspect, then it will be interesting to understand what are the problems or wha which are occurring. And this is why we call it a complex relationship because it is relationship which it runs across three, involving three parties, not only two, as we usually tend to think. So, uh, while uh, we know the knowledge transfer relatively in the north-south relationship, what we don't know is we don't know what are the ingredients which makes a successful transfer of knowledge within the tri triangle or tides what are the determinants, what are the factors which are uh, being important, we are playing a role and which have an impact on the success of the joint venture within that setup. And we will not be, so uh, I must add, this is the first leg of the study we are doing. Uh, there is a second uh, leg which we are uh, starting soon, but this is the first leg. Uh, why I'm saying, because we are not looking at the whole uh, set up uh, either three uh, actors we are, or three types of relationships, but we are looking specifically in this work at the l knowledge transfer from the local parent company to the joint venture. And we know this is, of course, uh, might seem artificial because we are looking only from one single lens and it's probably causing problems, but at least we are. We have made a step towards understanding that complex uh, uh, set of relationship between uh, what is uh, between the actors in the field. So the issues, uh, research objectives. Oops, is to look what are the determinants of the successful knowledge transfer within North South uh, venture. Uh, we would like to explore this perspective, the, f uh, the role of local parent firm and the determining factors that the transfer of favors the transfer of knowledge from the parent company. And specifically, we would like to raise the issue uh, in relation to southern country. And in this particular case, we are looking at the Tunisian affiliates. Uh, to what extent could uh, joint ventures which are uh, uh, working in uh, Tunisia, help build competitive capabilities 
through adequate knowledge transfer. You might wonder, why Tunisia? We are going to see uh, some of the features. Um, first of all, uh, Tunisia is one of the countries uh, in the south which has signed both three trade agreements with Europe, the first one in the Mediterranean countries to have signed the agreement, so it has a fairly long experience in terms of openness, and also is a member of the world WTO, also one of the eldest members in the region from uh, WTO. Uh, Tunisia has also the objectives of to diversify its economy, particularly after what so-called Arab Spring, after the, uh, the, the, the era of Ben Ali, uh, President Ben Ali, it became clear that what was supposed to be a strong economy working on tourism and uh, it's in fact uh, fairly weak and fairly vulnerable. To, so it has to diversify its economy because uh, it cannot remain uh, linked or dependent solely on tourism. And in fact, tourism has been one of the key sectors. It's not only one. It has been one of the key sectors in terms of foreign currency earning and uh, GDP uh, uh, income and, and that sort of thing. And uh, why it is also interesting to look at? Because the government has uh, been trying to enhance the global restructuring of domestic companies through a program which is called the Upgrading Program. What is the Upgrading Program? Program de mise à niveau. In fact, this is a program which is uh, initiated by the European Union to help all these partner countries, third partner countries, as you call them. The partner countries are all these countries which are around the Mediterranean Sea and which have uh, privileged or preferable uh, links, linkages with the European Union. So uh, the idea is to help these countries and these companies to upgrade their facilities to be able to face competition from the rest of the world, and specifically from Europe. So upgrading is, of course, developing the capabilities in terms of management, in terms of equipment, in terms of finance, in terms of access to information, and so on. And also, uh, uh, it is also, and in that uh, respect, it opens up uh, more than usual to uh, go into that process of upgrading, which means it has to be to do it through a joint venture, through alliances, and through also foreign direct investment, but mostly through joint ventures and alliances. And also, uh, as a result, active policy from government, which has been going on now for more than five years, to encourage partnership with foreign companies in order to raise their level of competitiveness. Uh, this is massively adopted by uh, the government policy in uh, the last uh, plan with the new, the current government. So uh, it has also some comparative advantages. Comparative advantages, of course, everyone knows that Tunisia is within uh, less than one hour from Italy. Uh, you can practically go swimming if you are a good swimmer. <laughs> um, from Tunis to the south of Italy. Freedom of capital transfer, which is, uh, of course, uh, uh, not common in those countries. Because one of the obstacles to foreign direct investment has been, of course, the uh, transfer of capital, which has been, hasn't been guaranteed by the various rules and regulations and made the foreign investment in those countries difficult or uh, inhibited uh, the uh, transfer uh, the foreign direct investment and all sorts of, uh, of investment. Uh, it is known to have a well qualified labor, one of the uh, most uh, structured, I would say, uh, education system it has been uh, uplifted uh, through the various development plans with uh, own effort, but also with a lot of support from various institutions. And because also uh, Tunisia has got one specific feature, it is a small population and a rel relatively uh, a small uh, uh, 
rate of uh, demographic uh, growth, one of the lowest in the region. Because as one say, uh, it has gone through its demographic transition uh, about 30 years ago uh, under the uh, presidency of uh, President Bourguiba. And uh, the location in the North African re region gives it uh, relatively good access to re the rest of the African continent. And the new strategy of, uh, in Europe and elsewhere is to use many of these uh, North African countries to, uh, of course, have access and to common strategy uh, to uh, various uh, African con uh, markets, either francophone or anglophone. And this is also Tunisia is uh, on that, uh, in that, that system. Relatively simplified administrative system and several incentives to attract foreign investors. Uh, they say that one of the most investment code, most advanced investment codes in terms of freedom is in Tunisia. So this is the reason why we thought that Tunisia was a, a good ground and uh, for us to examine what's happening in those uh, joint ventures. Uh, foreign direct investment, uh, I don't have perhaps time to go through this table, only uh, uh, giving you the stock, uh, which is uh, 33.001 million US uh, dollars. Uh, number of investment, greenfield, greenfield is totally new investment, okay? Not only uh, extending, but new field. Uh, as a percentage of uh, GF, CF? No? Yes, exactly. Uh, the global formation uh, of fixed capital, okay, it's investment, and also, of course, uh, stock of FDI, a percentage of GDP, as you see, is re relatively high. So uh, these are the problematics. This is our ground, and these are the uh, issues we are looking at. From there on, I will try to go into the classical way. Some literature review, if I may, some conceptual ideas about the concepts we have been used, conceptual framework, uh, the methodology we used, and some results and discussions, if I may. Fifteen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I've said the most important things. <laughs> This is set to the, the ground, then it's easy to understand. Okay. So for the literature review, I will not go in depth because it's, I don't, we, you have read, you know, the paper has been circulated. Okay. So uh, good. I will not have to go into details, but we uh, simply look at this, that in fact, we couldn't really do this work from only one prospect, either economic or managerial prospects, or we had to look at various uh, dimensions of the prospects at industrial economics, uh, innovation studies, uh, knowledge management, strategic management, so variety of, uh, of, of disciplines and of optics uh, were used to uh, tackle this problem. The so joint venture it, uh, uh, is, uh, of course, something which requires uh, uh, understanding the economics of it, the management of it, the cultural aspect of it, and, of course, the social and political aspect of it. Joint ventures, briefly, the international joint venture is a legal and uh, it's a distinct organizational entity, distinct, created by independent firms, generally, generally two or three partners, by transferring a fraction of their resources, financial, human knowledge, we'll see, to achieve a certain complementarity in order to, uh, to attain common objectives. This is one basic, basic definition. I mean, yeah, there, there, there are others. So uh, it is important that it isn't a means by itself. Joint venture is not there as a means, but just a way of facilitating the implementation of strategic objectives. In other words, you don't go for joint ventures because it's nice to have a joint venture. You go through joint ventures because you have a specific objective you cannot reach by other means. It's not because it's fashionable to be in joint ventures, so we go in venture. It's important because we have also people who go on the, for the wrong reasons into joint ventures and they can achieve their objectives as well. 
knowledge in the organization is embedded in three types of reservoirs. This is from the literature. Uh, the three types of reservoirs are uh, see Ergot and Graham. First is a human element, the capital, the knowledge, the know how, uh, training, competence, the members. Second reservoir, I like the term of reservoir because it's really a stock of things, of assets. Technological component, and the technological components are equipment, are plant, are the facilities, are etc. And the technological component is also important in a joint venture. And uh, the third reservoir which is mobilized is the tasks, the objectives, uh, intentions and goals that are uh, components which are mobilized. So, in any joint venture, you find all three to be successful. You have the competences, the members, the tools, the equipment, and the tasks, which are. That this is the basic, uh, basic setup. And knowledge transfer is seen as a displacement of a reservoir from one partner to the other. So it's either displacing all three at the same time, because a uh, joint venture requires that you need members, competences, tools, and tasks to the southern, to the partner from the south, which is members, tools, and tasks. But it could be also a uh, joint venture on one aspect. In other words, what is needed, the tools are there, the tasks are there, but what is needed are competencies. So joint venture rests on displacement of human resources engineers, managers, experts, whatever have you. So it's either full or partial joint venture. And this is really well explained in the literature that you can have and whenever, whatever the, the model, it is still a joint venture. It depends on what are the needs of the partner from the South and it depends also on the strategic uh, uh, aspects, the vision they have. Uh, two groups of knowledge transfer. So you have the first groove of knowledge transfer from the parent company to the joint venture, uh, where here you have learning organizations, space for learning and fertilizing, because uh, in both ways you have organization and you have also uh, cross uh, fertilization of knowledge. And the second group, this is more unilateral from the parent, the joint venture, a second group, it's more reciprocal Joint venture develops its own knowledge itself, so that is a recognition that the joint venture is also a learning entity. Because this is why we tend to, uh, the thing we, which is new in our analysis, we tend to think, to, uh, to forget that joint venture is also learning by its own. So without referring to the parent company, it develops its own ways of doing things. This is the famous do you I. Uh, doing, using, interacting. And this concept, paradigm of DUI, applies to the joint venture. In other words, some of the joint venture might develop competences and knowledge which are even more advanced than the parent company through R&D, through learning by doing, learning by managing, etc., learning by interacting. And in that sense, uh, we recognize that the joint venture here uh, is capable of also producing knowledge which can go from the partner to, uh, to from, the, from the, the, co the company in the south to the uh, parent company, from the partner to the parent company. This is all explained in the literature. Uh, motivation for displacing knowledge for a foreign uh, partner in, in a joint venture. I don't need to go through that because I've, uh, I've, I've said it already. Why, why should company indulge into joint venture, whether you can do it directly without part local partner. Here you have good reasons, new market, the skills of the local parent company, direct and easy access to local resources, sharing risks and gains. And uh, this is to remind you what the setup we are working on. You have the parent company, which is of course uh, in relation with the local joint venture, but you have also the local parent firm, the parent company, which is also in relation with the joint venture. So knowledge flows is from the parent firm to the local joint venture. 
It is also from the foreign parent firm to the local parent firm. And it is, of course, between the local parent firm to the local joint venture. So this is uh, what I said earlier, is a TIDIC, three entities interacting all the time to make it successful or not successful. So what we have decided to look at, and this is the first leg, that's why it is, I, I said it's a preliminary work, we have decided to look only at this dimension here, from local parent firm to local joint venture. This is our research target. And this is already. And now, of course, we are hoping that in second uh, leg, we will, we will go in a big way, looking uh, this time at both parent firm to local joint venture and far, uh, foreign parent company to uh, local parent firm. So this is just to, uh, to, to, to define the research framework we are working on and to make the, 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 the reading easier if you have read the text. Uh, we have seen the conceptual work. So uh, the creation of a joint venture is often part of the strategic orientation of parent companies operating a new specific environment. The study of the phenomenon of knowledge transfer need to take into account this specificity and the uh, interdependencies, uh, uh, interdependencies and interfaces that exist between local parent firm and joint venture is, uh, itself. So uh, to be able to characterize this type of relationship, we had to go, uh, of course, to look at uh, what, what has been done elsewhere, to uh, see what are the key variables which make it successful or not successful. And here we, we through the literature, we found it's a very complex uh, issue because we have characteristics of the local parent firm. We have the characteristic of the joint venture itself. We have the characteristics of the relationship between the partners. We have characteristic related to strategic, cultural, organizational dimension. And we have the characteristic of the communication support of the transfer mechanism. So all these have come out in the literature as being uh, relevant and important aspect of joint venture through various contributions. And I think it's clearly explained uh, in the paper. If you go through it. So uh, very briefly, if we look at the characteristic of local, local parent firm, then you have the openness of the leaders, learning intent, learning uh, preparedness of members, experience in the field of cooperation of the local parent company. All this, uh, the work by Incan, Hamel, and uh, Simona uh, has been uh, quite uh, uh, interesting in that sense. Characteristic of the joint ventures, uh, which has come out through the literature is age, performance of the joint venture, uh, absorptive capacity, uh, which is an important concept been in, in the uh, economics of innovation, has uh, Cohen and Livintal have brought this concept some years ago, and it now it is getting more, you know getting a, a lot of importance and getting uh, strength. And absorptive capacity is also an, impo an important aspect of joint venture success. Uh, if we look at the partners' relationship, then, of course, uh, it is clear that trust comes into it. If you go into joint venture, one of the key elements for a successful joint venture is mutual trust, because you can't do it only on the basis of control uh, or mistrust. Uh, ability to resolve mutual conflicts in the, in the relationship, quality of contribution from parent company, all these authors I mentioned. If we look at the cultural related characteristics related to strategic, cultural, and organizational uh, dimension, we found that one of the dimensions is strategic compatibility. And often when we looked at the failures of joint venture, this factor has come out always as one of the key factors that the company, the joint venture, uh, the foreign or the parent company and the local company have uh, divergent strategic uh, strategies and they are not compatible. And at one stage or another, they are not working together and they split because they're... So strategic compatibility is a very important. I, it's you, the... Okay. <laughs> it's looking at him to be gentle, kind. Okay. okay. Oh, so it's you, okay. Compatible, organizational compatibility. All this is in the paper, but I had to recall it. From there on, then we decided on uh, 18 key variables 
because you might wonder where do the variables come from, what we call independent variables. These were the variables which we have mobilized. So these are explained here, and uh, the idea is to the uh, what makes a successful transfer of knowledge from local parent firm to uh, to the joint venture. So these are four sets, five sets of variables, uh, which we are uh, drawn from this broad literature review of women. And we, we can, we group them, because this is our uh, methodology we used, we group them into five entities. Uh, so as time is short, I will not go uh, through that. Case study, as I said, we decided to work on the Tunisian ground. So we looked at uh, four joint ventures. Uh, here they are in uh, four different sectors, electronics, food industry, machinery for food industry. Oops, I don't know why it's moving like that. Uh, uh, tele technology, technology, yes. <laughs> uh, I won't go uh, into uh, this in, uh, in depth, but perhaps the share of capital might be of, in, of interest. And the age of the joint venture is interesting. Look, they range from 13 years of age up to 27 years of age. It means they're working quite successfully. If you, because usually the joint venture within the next couple of years, it disappears if it's not successful, between two and five years. Here, they have all crossed that path of danger. 13 years, you are already okay. 27 years, you are very good. Uh, the other win is the share of, uh, you see, 40% of local, 60% foreign, 49% foreign, 30%, 51% foreign capital. Uh, we looked at, uh, interviewed 47 people. Uh, I don't need to have, perhaps to go into this, this is more for researchers, I believe. It's, uh, we use the lexical intensity methodology, which is simply the number of uh, uh, concept or word comes out in a discussion in, uh, around uh, some aspect of the joint venture. So it's a number Lexical intensity represents a number of words related to the theme and the total number. And we used also the Pearson correlation, which is something you certainly know of too. Results, as I have to be brief. Um, so uh, it seems that the. Oop, let me go to this directly. It's uh, good <laughs> that it comes here. <laughs> so this is the um, most important one. So the weight of topics related to the contribution of local companies, uh, when we did the frequency and percentages, you see the elements, the first 10. In fact, we initially we decided to keep only the 10 ones, but I added those because it's, they seem to be important, even though they don't score perhaps that high. But knowledge transfer, of course, is the dependent variable. Performance of the joint venture is important for knowledge transfer, of course. Uh, it's uh, obvious. If, if it is successful, that means knowledge transfer is, is being uh, transferred. Size of local parent company, parent firm, uh, equilibrium of negotiating part partners or negotiating between the partners. So c c ability to negotiate, that's what it says exactly. Strategic compatibility, I've seen earlier that strategic incompatibility breaks the joint venture. Mutual trust, key for 60% of people, openness of local manager, it's obvious, quality of partners contribution, mastery of the Tunisian context. Uh, if you don't know what Tunisia is all about in terms of economy, sociology, and that sort of thing, rules. Informal relationship between partners. That is, uh, I, I believe that is a key element, although it is only in 10th row, uh, it, it, to me it, it could, should be even higher because it's important. But of course there are also cultural compatibility and this is not uh, as you'd see is it's not um, doesn't come uh, as a surprise because you don't have to be of the same cultural uh, pattern to work together in fact you could be even from totally different cultures and yet yet work successfully in joint venture so i'm not surprised that it comes here at the 11th uh, row uh, in terms of the weight, we have also uh, given an average weight. As you can see, this is more or less uh, the contribution that gives us uh, only simply the weight it has taken. Then we worked on uh, one more direct using uh, the Pearson correlation test on what are the most significant variables 
uh, independent variables which are uh, the key for a successful knowledge transfer in a joint venture. And we have, we looked at the variety and we discarded some weak correlations of the correlations which were under 0.20. We thought that they're not interesting or significant. So we kept only those which are above. And here, that makes it clear that four main components. The first one is openness of local managers. Okay, that's an important key, 0.67 of Pearson correlation. Bargaining power between partners. That is a very important issue. If you are capable of bargaining all the time successfully between the then non guys, but if you can't bargain, then of course it's uh, not successful. Cultural compatibility seems to be important here. And Tunisian, knowing the Tunisian business context. This is what the, uh, the, the person says. The result, uh, the local parent companies are active partners in the knowledge transfer. In other words, it's not only the foreign partner which are... Uh, uh, they, uh, they transfer understanding local regional business context, prospection, prospection of knowledge and techniques, knowledge uh, specific to the Tunisian market, expertise, uh, management of human resource, HRM, it's human resource management, uh, assistance or day-to-day -day management, and of course, we uh, adapt to the needs. And then we realize that in some of these relations, they are not that linear, because there are so many things happening at the same time. It's not one variable on the other. Then we uh, found, when we looked in more depth, that some uh, of the, uh, the uh, setup, the relations are very complex. It's not between two variables, between three. In other words, Knowledge transfer is at the same time dependent on bargaining power between partners and openness of local manager. So we tried to look at this complex relationship. We did it only here, but in fact, uh, uh, there's many more. If we had time, we could present all this type of complex triadic relationship all over. We find them if for mutual trust. We will find them for uh, uh, tr for uh, the knowledge transfer for performances. So, just to say that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the joint uh, venture, the, the knowledge transfer, is with, within a complex setup. It has to be studied in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, because we have single or simple interactions, but we have also complex and non-linear relations. It is clear that uh, we will not, I will not go. Discussion, so we have Highlighted the magnitude of pattern of learning, which takes place between joint venture, uh, which is a, a, a way we have not done before. The dimension hardly addressed in depth in the literature. Our added value is this contribution of into the core piece of knowledge. Uh, another dimension to the work done by Lilis and Salk, and uh, the traditional factor for seeking joint venture on the part of foreign companies, uh, which were usually thought as only economic considerations or economic factors have to be reviewed. It's not economic factors which are making the success, not how much you pay and how much you gain, how much you earn. That is only one dimension. What is a mention is knowledge and learning. And this can be assets, okay? A new asset for successful a joint venture, as if you had a, And that, of course, we are in the immaterial economy. And of course, the research of the local parent firm is also actively involved. Uh, we have limits. Before you give me my limits, I give my own limits. <laughs> so that we don't have anything to say. No, no, I'm sure you have plenty to say. Uh, some points, first of all. I did not say. I did not say. I did not say. We have a non probable pro Our limits of our work. We recognize huh? uh, non-probabilistic method to constitute the sample because we have gone a convenient sample where we had the uh, relations. Then we went and did the interview. Some bias is bound to be in the results. That's normal. Uh, this method, which we used for the first time, this is I uh, remind you that this is a method used by linguists and in uh, sociological and anthropological studies, rarely used in management and economic studies, so we are running a little risk in adopting it. It has, of course, a limit. 
And the data collection at joint venture level may not be sufficient. We have only four case studies. And of course, out of four case studies, we can't pretend drawing lessons for all joint ventures of the world. Thank you. I will not go into the other one. Okay, now we're going to present um, the main topic, um, knowledge transfer in joint ventures. Uh, the structure of our presentation will be as follows. Etiana will elaborate more on the key concepts. I will present the summary of the papers and the main findings and contributions. Then Etiana will talk more about relevant considerations uh, regarding the nature of knowledge or transfer capacity. Following, we will talk about questions and then the references. Okay. Thank you. So, um, knowledge transfer actually was discussed uh, widely from the professor, but I just wanted to give a general um, definition of what knowledge transfer is. So, it's the process through which organizational units are affected by the knowledge-based experience of one another. And there are some other things about it here, but I just wanted to underline that uh, the two main, the most important things are, first of all, that it is a manageable process, uh, so it can be redirected uh, when the feedback is not as, as when the outcome is not as expected, and then it can be continuously improved. Um, so, yeah. uh, we then have to, um, we, we thought about discussing why knowledge transfer is relevant and we saw that from two aspects. First, the relevance for the firm. Uh, actually, building on Penrose theory that sees the enterprise as a collection of sticky and uh, difficult to imitate resources. Uh, then Lee and Salk uh, saw knowledge as a crucial strategic resource for competitiveness. Um, then we have another contribution from, from Harrigan uh, with the dynamic capabilities view of the firm, which, uh, who says that acquisition of new capabilities through organizational learning for, uh, is very important for competitive strategies. But uh, seeing that from a more broad uh, pros uh, perspective, we can also mention the relevance that it has for development, since we are talking about North uh, and South joint ventures. And um, there, there, are, there is plenty of literature, actually, that um, testifies that knowledge transfer through intellectual properties such as patents um, is not as effective as knowledge transfer through joint ventures. Um, so the deployment of uh, useful technologies for developing countries can uh, needs um, it's necessary to have this know-how that actually comes with the building of a joint venture because it's more interactive than the uh, solely uh, transfer through patents or other IP instruments. Uh, then we go to the definition of the joint venture. We already saw that, but uh, the main... Um, the main reasons that the joint venture um, for the joint venture to to take place are first of all the need to, uh, for access to a new market, then to gain scale efficiencies, to share the risk for major investments or pro processes uh, or projects, and then to access skills and capabilities. That is the case of knowledge transfer. Um, then here we schematize what the professor also talked about. That is the multi-dimensional aspect of the knowledge transfer process. It can happen between the two parent firms. It happens from the two parents for, uh, from each of the parent firm to the joint venture. But it can also happen from the joint venture to the two firms. Uh, even though um, the, most, the, the biggest part of the literature is uh, uh, discusses that the joint venture actually has this extracting or ha harvesting uh, effect on, this, uh, on the knowledge in this paradigm. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about the paper. Um, as we so the intentions for us was to provide another perspective and evidence the importance and the role of the local parent firm in transfer knowledge process in the joint venture. The driving question of the paper, as you already told, um, was that it, which are the determinants of a successful knowledge transfer within a north-south joint venture? The methodology was the multiple case study approach, the four joint ventures installed in Tunisia, and the data was analyzed by the lexical intensity method that you elaborated very well. 
Um, here we try to schematize the um, factors influencing the knowledge transfers, as we can see from the perspective or the characteristics of local parent fir firm. Uh, we see the openness of managers, learning intent of members, experience in the field of cooperation, and the size. From the perspective of the joint venture, it's the age, learning motivation, management, and very important, the business context of the country. Of the relationship between the partners, the ability to resolve mutual conflicts, mutual trust, negotiation, power between partners, quality of contributions from parent companies. So there were 18 independent variables that influenced the dependent variable, uh, that in this case was the successful transfer of knowledge uh, from the local parent firm to the joint venture, uh, findings and originality. The, the local parent firm is actively involved in the successful transfer of knowledge to the joint venture and in fact its contributions are essential to ensure a successful joint venture. Uh, also we found out or we concluded that the paper said the greater the size of the local parent firm the more balancing the negotiation power and it concludes that the key factors over the 18 variables, um, the key factors for a successful knowledge transfer include the performance of the joint venture, the size of the local parent firm, strategic compatibility, balance of regaining power between companies, mutual trust, and quality of contributions, and cultural compatibility. Um, as Jana said at the beginning, there are two currents of literature that focus on knowledge transfer. One, on knowledge transfer from parent firm in developed countries to the joint venture in developing countries. The other one is knowledge transfer from both parent firms to the joint venture. But what we found more interesting from this paper is that it gave us a different perspective and focused more on the um, local parent firm and its approaches that can make to the joint venture. And uh, we thank you so much for the, um, the paper that gives um, such a deep insight on the, no, on the joint venture um, situation in Tunisia. And also we like the fact that it schematizes a lot um, the, um, the characteristics, making it more easy to read and digestive. Um, you discussed a lot about the methodology that we found it very interesting because it was the first time we saw it. But um, that was it. Now, Ejana will talk about the relevance of the nature of transferred knowledge and also the, the relevance of transfer capacity. Okay, so um, to now we're discussing about the knowledge transfer process, but uh, I think it's very relevant to uh, see actually um, what role plays the nature of the um, knowledge itself. So uh, here I quote Polanyi, uh, who says that agents know more than they can tell, implying that there exists two types of knowledge, one that is explicit, that is found in uh, books, documents, and uh, this is uh, according to the literature, easy, easily transferable. Uh, and then the other one that is tacit, uh, that is sticky as well, and it's rooted in context, experience, practice, values, and it's hard to communicate. Um, this consideration is actually, at our point of view, important because the processes for each type of knowledge transfer and their resource uh, requirements are very different. Uh, also, tested knowledge deserves particular attention in the analysis of firm resource, uh, resources because it can be a, a very strong source of distinctive uh, competitive advantage. Also for the fact that it is uh, very difficult to appropriate this kind of knowledge. So it's really uh, contextual to the, to the firm and it stays there most, uh, at most of the time. And um, then the establishment of joint ventures is seen as uh, one of the most efficient means to learn and absorb technology and tacit know-how uh, that is actually organizationally embedded. 
Another consideration that I wanted to make uh, was that in the literature, most of the existing literature focuses on the role of absorptive capacity, as also the professor discussed before. But uh, here I think we overlook an important factor that is also the transfer capa capacity of the uh, firm that transfers the knowledge. Uh, so um, actually there are, there are plenty of uh, contributions in this uh, in this point here, so parent companies possess rich knowledge base, but sometimes they fail to appoint uh, competent employers uh, to transfer know-how. And why is this issue actually important? Because, as I said before, uh, this the tacit dimension of knowledge is sticky to the individual, and uh, it cannot be codified in any way. So it's very important to pick the right individuals to facilitate uh, this process. Then cost associated with knowledge transfer in the intra-firm context can be really substantial, but such costs may, may be even higher in cross-border uh, transfers where, different, uh, where differences in cultural, political and social economic aspects compound uh, the difficulty of the transfer. Um, and we draw some possibly, uh, possible implications for uh, effective tacit knowledge transfers, which are HR uh, policies, which should take uh, in consideration, first of all, the competence of the individual. And uh, ad the other thing is that uh, should take into consideration also uh, the cultural, uh, cultural uh, let's say, uh, component of the individual, let's say that he sh uh, the, the company should pick uh, individuals that are able to interact in uh, mul multicultural contexts. Then we raise some questions. Okay, so the first question is, the study showed that size of local parent played an important role in balancing the bargaining power between partner and in knowledge transfer itself. What are the implications for the equity share of local parent company? How does the equity share of the local parent firm impact the knowledge transfer process? And yeah, here um, we wanted to know if uh, firm three, in your case study that had 70% of equity, um, showed some differences uh, from the other firms in the knowledge transfer process. Uh, then there is another question, which is that uh, alliances can be a net positive experience in which both partners learn, but it can they can also be a zero-sum game in which the partner learning um, uh, the fastest dominates the relationship. And uh, alliances can be the platform for mutual value creation. Uh, joint ventures north-south are usually created for resource exploitation, as we know, without generation of a significant knowledge flow from foreign partner to the joint venture. So since we know that you have made substantial research in uh, Maghreb countries and um, in knowledge flows in these countries, we wanted to know whether you could provide us some uh, insights from uh, the Tunisian case. Um, and we wanted to, to generalize a bit the discussion from the firm level to maybe the national level. And um, the other thing is, uh, we you could say it's like the vice versa of this question. Uh, we know that uh, FDI have uh, an important role in the Tunisian economy, especially after the free trade agreement with the EU in uh, 1985. But uh, we wanted also to uh, know, since we know that you have worked also on the national system of innovation, we want to know how the Tunisian national system of innovation could impact FDIs. And that was it. Here are our references. And thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much for the excellent work you have done. Very good. Uh, excellent work because you have understood the paper better than I did. So <laughs> it was so clear. But uh, okay, now I, uh, now I understand better what thing I have done. <laughs> no, no, but serious. We know you have done very. You have really seized the heart of the issues. That's not easy because when we started working on this paper uh, a year and a half back, it was very complicated. And it took us time to understand what we want to talk about. Whereas you did it like uh, very kindly and professionally within short time. So well done. Um, <coughs> no, but uh, I, I think I have no uh, uh, remarks as uh, the way you've uh, mm, grasped 
the issue. So I am not. I think you have already you have uh, really clearly uh, uh, set the aspects of the problematics and uh, uh, quite uh, rightly you have added some value by uh, going. Uh, further in depth into the definition of knowledge and what it is inside, of course. Uh, we thought at one stage we might even give a whole section uh, on knowledge issues, but uh, then it became too long and we were uh, afraid that we might go out of the problematics. We, we had really to restrict it, as I said. Uh, the background of this paper is we do, we do uh, exploratory study first on only one part of that uh, complex setup and see, see how it works. And if, if it gives the results, then we probably go back. And the way we are going, we are hoping to do it, provided some funding, but we will examine the whole setup. And in that case, we will go back uh, in knowledge issues and uh, in more depth. And of course, the uh, uh, you quite rightly distinguished between IP and, uh, and, and uh, joint venture because you realized that uh, intellectual property is only one aspect and you can have a most sophisticated IP or contract, whatever have you, and yet only minor part of knowledge flows effectively. And we have examples from that region. We have thousands of I IPs of, 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 of uh, licenses bought uh, either bought a very high cost or fallen in the public domain, and yet uh, knowledge is not being transferred. So it's quite right to uh, distinguish that. Um, now coming to the issue of, uh, uh, of tacit and explicit uh, codified. Yes, I think it's a key issue. Uh, I think we have uh, at one stage, we referred to it, I, I can't remember, maybe not, May uh, we, uh, we, even if we didn't do it explicitly, it's implicit, of course, we, uh, we refer. But it is an important aspect on uh, uh, understanding knowledge. Of course, if we are referring to explicit knowledge, uh, according to the terms of Polanyi, then, then the problem is not raised because it's codified. It's codified, it's well costed, it's uh, organized in terms of flows. Uh, within regulations, within mechanisms, which are, that is easy. So an explicit uh, knowledge doesn't, but the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, uh, the implicit knowledge, and that is more complicated. Because why is it complicated? Where do we set the, 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 the frontier, the border? Because implicit knowledge goes all over the place. Uh, it, it has several components. It is knowledge, but it's also the uh, sociological setup. It's the political and regulations which got around it. It is, so it's a variety of factors which bring, which, uh, which makes the explicit, uh, the uh, implicit knowledge difficult to grasp. And I happen to have actually supervised a thesis on explicit and implicit knowledge. <laughs> so for three years I have heard only that. <laughs> Four years. Now he's a doctor, my student. So, I, I mean, I've gone into the depth of these uh, issues. Uh, it is important. Of course, we are referring to implicit here, not the, because not what, uh, mostly uh, what. But uh, having said that, that it is explicit and it is implicit, it's not still uh, as uh, automatic, as mechanical as you would think. Because there is another political factor which we haven't addressed in this issue, is willingness of transferring knowledge. To what extent the partner is willing to use its Im implicit knowledge to get the... Uh, the because uh, although uh, the, uh, the, the joint venture is something decided strategically, but it's only a minor part of a whole strategy of the partner for the North. So it, it's, it's not really encompassing all the knowledge. So he made the, the, the company, the, you know, the, the, the parent company may dispense even implicit knowledge only in a very strategic term. In, in other words, if it's, uh, let's say, in Tunisia, it is one type of knowledge which can be uh, given access, free access to, and then the engineers and go there, and there is experience, there is interaction, and, the, and so on. 
But that is only part of the knowledge. And here we are, we probably have to go uh, to something I've done, I think, last year, uh, of the issue of a global value chain. Because it, it's linked to global value chain. What kind of knowledge at what si uh, si uh, part of the uh, life cycle of the activity or of the technology? It's not the same. If you are at the beginning in, in the uh, stage of growth of technology, which is newly introduced, of course, the, the, the strategy in doing partnership in that sense, it's di difficult that if you were in uh, the decline of life cycle or ma let's say last stage of maturity, I if you have last stage of maturity. So if we cross, I mean, this with uh, what you said, implicit and explicit uh, uh, knowledge, it will be more explicit knowledge when the technology is just uh, growing because there is less thing you want to do. It is really the, your breadwinner with the future. So in that sense, you will not allow a lot of implicit knowledge to go through. We will be more codified, more uh, contractual, more everything is in documents, and a little implicit knowledge, because we have said it is on material trust. But if you have, uh, if you are the other end of the life cycle, then it will be, of course, you know that technology is dying out in few years. The technology is ending its life cycle. Okay? In that case, there will be a lot of implicit uh, knowledge being shared uh, with a minimum cost, etc. So you see, it is also depends. Uh, we, once we have said it's implicit and explicit, that's not enough. That's only part of the story. What are we talking about? But here we have, uh, I think, uh, although we have perhaps not addressed it explicitly, but it is there. If you look at all these variables, you have listed them, uh, I think, here somewhere. Okay? The 18 variables we have looked, the, the, the relevant. Okay? There? I don't know where you. Before, before, before. Okay. Then uh, this, uh, this, this third column here, uh, of course, it's relevant to uh, implicit knowledge because this is through managing this relationship in an adequate way, then you will open the space for implicit knowledge to come into it. Okay. If, you, if you do this well and you, you neglect this one, there will be very little implicit knowledge. Implicit knowledge will come when you manage correctly the relationship, mutual trust, when you negotiate, maybe tough, but when you negotiate, you are able to overcome uh, problems. This is an, an added element to mutual trust. When uh, the quality of the contribution of parent company, this, you open up the space to implicit knowledge, you see? So implicit knowledge comes at one stage, but it doesn't come all the way through. This is only explicit could do here. Implicit over there. Can we go to the questions? Because we have also other questions from other students. I haven't finished. <laughs> no? <laughs> Can I? OK. I think I've, I've said maybe the most important. But uh, yes, uh, I uh, transfer capacity. Yeah, you have said, uh, I've said the uh, willingness. The equity share, um, equity share, uh, my personal view, it has uh, reached its limits, really. Because equity share, you may have equity share, quite uh, important, from the local company, 70%. Yet, it is very weak in knowledge transfer, because it hasn't got all the other elements which make uh, knowledge transfer uh, relevant. It might be small, lower equity share, but yet, having all the other ingredients, building trust, knowing, managing the negotiations, uh, etc., And that will make it even more amenable to transfer of knowledge than simply uh, having uh, the equity. Because what can you tell the parent company if the, the relation is conflictual, if the parent company uh, is always being reminded of rules, regulations, if there is distance, 
And this some uh, a viewpoint which, because I, I, I'm always uh, amused when I say some country is saying, we'll see, if you want to come do business in our country, then you have to take 49% and we take 51%. <laughs> and the bureaucrats are all happy. I don't need to mention the countries. <laughs> I know one very well. Uh, and everybody is happy saying, yes, we have won. Everyone, of course, I mean, this is an outdated mode of thing. That's not what matters. I mean, you can have only, you can have 18% or 20% of equity as a parent company a year and yet transfer 10% of the knowledge you want to transfer. That's a big issue. But you are raising a very, very important key issue. The, this is referring to, uh, uh, this is about equity. And uh, I, I make, a, make a disti slight distinction, we make a slight distinction between uh, joint venture with the, the local company and alliances, if I am. We, we, we said it, maybe it isn't clear, but at one stage, in the paper, that alliances, it's broader sense and have to be treated in a separate way. But you are really very specific on triadic type of relationships, which is parent company, local company, and joint venture, which is more specific. This is this. That's about it. And I... Thank you so much for answering our questions. Now we will open the table for any questions. We'll take the first one. Uh, hello, thank you so much for the uh, presentation of today. Uh, my name is Maria Matalla. I'm from Egypt. Um, I'm from Option C. And what is Option C? Uh, ah, okay. Well, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, well, yeah, I share some uh, study about um, uh, economics of knowledge and also development studies. Um, I've been in WITS uh, with Professor Mario Sherry. Okay. <laughs> and um, I would like to ask you uh, two things because I'm already working on the technology transfer, but from the other mode of transfer. Uh, from uh, the university to the businesses. Okay. And um, speaking specifically about the North African uh, region, um, what, what, how would you um, uh, evaluate the, the technology transfer, whether from the university uh, to business or from uh, FDI and joint ventures, which, which mode of transfer would you say is more effective and more relevant to the region? Um, and I think when we are talking about the North African countries, um, they somehow look very much homogenous in terms of diversification, <laughs> relatively. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, compared to the other part of the Arab region, yeah, at least. Yeah. But, uh, uh, we, we, are, we, we fall in the same GDP per capita category and so on. And uh, uh, the second, if there are some uh, potential for regional collaboration. Um, yeah, I don't want to take too much time because others would like. Uh, do I group the question or I answer one by one? Like if you want me, OK. So I group the questions. OK. Um, Thank you, sir, for such a good presentation. Uh, it was um, very good to hear about this topic generally. Um, th the um, I am Maria Mehmed, and I am from Knowledge Economics. My uh, like I I am from op Option A, and I studied Knowledge Economics as a whole. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the knowledge transfer process that you just talked about. If we are, uh, if we talk about the neoliberal policies as a whole and how they transform the economies in the developing countries through FDI influx and stuff, neoliberalism has been tailored in a way that the technologies have been transferred uh, according to the. Uh, and they have been tailored according to the way the capitalist class actually wants them. Like, um, 
depends it, it depends upon their own interest in the same way the developed countries when they transfer the technologies to the host countries basically the technology doesn't come in its form that it should be the like the good form of technology and the knowledge transfer is not here i want to exemplify the maruti suzuki example of india that's very commonly known as one of the joint ventures all over the world as a success story and one of the huge uh failure stories in fdi market if indians critique actually watch this as because the technology that came from japan was very redundant and it organized the automobile company but the knowledge transfer wasn't successful as a whole and developing country at this spot i don't think we need more number of cars or automobiles in our economy but we need more number of universities and the knowledge transfer should be in a different way instead of just transferring the um S- uh, making a labor come and making him helpful to make a car and there is no market for that car in that particular economy as such so i want you to shed some light on that developing part and the critical analysis of fdi yeah right thank you If you have time, is it okay? Okay. okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you are master of time. So you, 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 ask, for, you, you ask for him to answer, right? Si. Right now, then we have another Second. set of questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, both very interesting questions. Uh, but the, well, the North African context um well i don't particularly think it's that homogeneous because i've been doing work i don't like in egypt on the specific issue of fdi you could find that work published somewhere i don't know where. um on algeria on tunisia and of course its country has got its own history its own setup uh, its own uh, rules and uh, regulations and the politics of course because when it comes to technology transfer fdi and um one thing we haven't talked about here is the political dimension of it mm-hmm. is very important that can be a tool for promoting uh knowledge transfer which can be uh, rather an obstacle because of variety of reasons including uh, economic social political and uh, cultural reasons so uh uh the university to business transfer well this is a, i think one of the key questions we have been looking at this issue for i don't want to give you my age for 40 years <laughs> <laughs> i think the first thing i committed in my life the first article was the 35 years a book i can't even send it to you and yet 35 years and we seem to be still going back to the issue there's something wrong so it hasn't moved we still are talking about the two big entities living in closed uh, set up big walls ivory ivory uh, towers if you look at the recent articles it seems that the things are repeating itself in that particular region so i i, I believe there is basically something uh, which is structurally wrong uh, in that particular setup uh having said that There are of course uh, now we realize that the more and more because of the um, uh openness because of the uh, of course the 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 uh, um uh the new pressures which this countries are, are going through and some of these pressures are I I said it diversification all countries are with the two major challenges youth unemployment and diversification of the economy because they have been too relying too much on one source or two sources of income either mineral or vegetable and that has been that model economic burden has run out has reached its limit so now we see there are some prospects of of course university for instance most universities have been looking uh, at uh, recent times particularly in Tunisia and they have all set up this uh, uh, intermediate institution to uh, liaise between the university and the business most of them 
as uh, you call them different ways. In Egypt, they are quite famous because they do this, this interaction. I've looked at them in Tunisia. In Egypt. So now we see there is uh, a, a more higher awareness of the need of uh, mobilizing more and in more efficient way the local knowledge to uh, address the issues, either technical or managerial, or whatever, that thing. And because of also that they, they you see, we, we say that the, uh, the falling of income or the, the mineral resources, it's, it's uh, something of a, uh, a curse. But uh, in a way, it is also a blessing. Because when it goes down, then everybody has to find uh, ways to. And now that is going down. And there is no more resources to easily import knowledge, ready made knowledge for various companies or consultancy bureaus, whatever have you. So you have to do whatever you have within the borders. So there are three or four indicators where showing that we may be uh, going in a, in a turning point where university suddenly is becoming uh, an actor, relevant actor for the uh, a new growth model, and s particularly also for sustainability. I mean, everybody knows that we have the, the, the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, and Sustainable Development Goals, you can't import uh, the limits of what you can bring from abroad. Sustainability how within the country, okay? So we are, we are there's l l some elements which are bringing to think, bringing we, uh, to think that we may be going uh, uh, through a new qualitative, qualitative stage which in where university uh, could have a say, provided of course the university uh, <coughs> questions itself. It has to do a lot of uh, government issues because university as it stands now, uh, particularly with the old generations, is sort of brought up uh, in being a closed entity. Now with the uprising of youth, the, with the, uh, all the new dynamics of industrial economics like uh, uh, opening up to uh, entrepreneurship, uh, not relying on, on, on employment from the public service, etc. These are issues which, we, uh, we, which, which I believe throughout North Africa are, are, are slightly bringing a change, but not to a large scale. In other words, you, you have success stories. Alexandria, you have that. Something. We are doing very, very well in terms of mobilizing uh, companies or students and uh, getting close to uh, uh, involved into clusters, into uh, technopoles, whatever have you. But uh, what what is important issue now? How to? Uh, it's critical mass. I have a, I have a paper actually uh, which you find on uh, my website. On I've shown the, the website which you can uh, diffuse. I have a paper on this particular issue: how you go from success stories, individual success stories, to, crit to critical mass. So, what is now <coughs> the challenge? How can we build on these success stories to make it subject to policy making? Because if it comes only here and there. In fact, now a lot of work is being done on success stories. That's not enough. That's good to have success stories because you know that it works in that particular environment. But how you go from success stories, individual success stories, to make it mass critical mass so that they can policy uh, instrument for the government, you see. So this is m more or less. And potential for regional collaboration is a tremendous potential for regional collaboration, but uh, provided the political dimension is solved. That is a key issue. If we, you may have all the beautiful mo economic models or managerial models or whatever have you, but their political dimension is there. And that is the key issue to make it uh, feasible. <laughs> if you want me to stay another three hours. <laughs> oh my. No, no, yeah, the, just look at the map. <laughs> <laughs> Just look at the map. Yes, uh, the second, uh, which is very important as well, uh, <coughs> uh, 
what what you are, you are, what you are raising, in fact, is you are saying if we if some knowledge which has been brought up in a, a certain setup, which is capitalist uh, and liberalism uh, economy, liber liberal economy, is applicable to a different setup which doesn't obey to this kind of rules. Yeah, right. yeah. And the knowledge that is being brought up is like a very capitalist interest approach knowledge. It's not something like uh, labor can actually get benefited from that knowledge. Okay, there takes, they create employment, but then there is this exploitation of labor in hand with that. Mm. Yeah. But if they do mm. so, the capitalist interest is being protected in a very different way by yeah. tailoring these neoliberal policies through this FDI and flux. Mm. That actually is not just the increase of GDP that matters, but what matters is basically how are you going to change this path of developing into a developed path. Mm. This cannot take place through just, I guess, these joint ventures and transfer of mm. a trivial knowledge that is redundant in your country and now you bring it to my country and you try to impose and train my labor on that. No, the, uh, knowledge, first of all, um, we've seen it is an interactive process. Knowledge is something uh, which you have, I, 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 sh I think we, we shouldn't look at it as something which is static, which is produced somewhere and being moved to other place. I think that view is, uh, is obsolete. We are in a new dimension of knowledge. Knowledge is a process of interacti interactive process. So uh, whatever you might think in terms of knowledge, is something which you in the South and me in the North can we produce together in certain sectors. As I said, it's, uh, what the, the, the heart of the, the is that you can learn as much as from the South, then you can teach the South on specific uh, dimensions, specific sectors. So if you think of as a static, which is something you, you move from one place, of course you have uh, this kind of conclusions. But you mustn't think in terms of it. It's something which... Sorry? It can be interaction and exploitation. Expo yeah, yeah. Yes, exploitation. exploitation and interaction. And the learning dimension is very important. This is the heart of evolutionary thinking. <coughs> uh, you have to look at the work done by Globelix, I think. <laughs> this is the, the me mecca of, glob of, uh, of uh, evolutionary thinking in the world. Okay. Uh, uh, that and, and the, uh, the, the the thing is yeah the the uh, the learning dimension is is very important and uh, what matters also that the learning is not class specific you don't have the managers who learn and at the lower hierarchy the workers the laborer the, who, who doesn't learn who is just executive that is beyond that is also an old reality. It is not the reality to do that. Sometimes the knowledge is more importantly mastered uh, at the lower level than at the top level, at the hierarchy. Okay? It's the power of the, the, the people, of the workers, okay? which in, in terms of knowledge. Look at the, the, the work did done by Dick Nelson, uh, uh, was produced something on this, the knowledge and structural and the uh, society and structure of society. Well, it produced two years uh, ago. So you see, uh, that's why when you put it in sort of uh, neat nutshell and very neat, this is capitalism and this, uh, it's not re reality is more complex. Knowledge has, we have to look at this uh, as a new paradigm, okay? You have to, what your uh, colleagues, uh, friends did earlier, you look at knowledge and specific. The work of Polanyi is only one aspect of the work of Nonakai Takeuchi is also uh, one aspect. There are so many other ways of characterizing knowledge. Doc, if you look at it in different perspective, then you have, uh, you, 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 you probably get away with this, with this views, which are, I believe are a little outdated. Sorry. Okay, so now we have time for just a couple questions. Um, so first of all, I would like to ask I'll just have a short question. Um, hello, Professor. Thank you for uh, this uh, uh, presentation. I am Afroz Alam, and I'm from uh, Bangladesh, and I'm from uh, I'm also from uh, development part in this uh, program. So my question is about you said about this uh, knowledge transfer. Uh, so how this knowledge transfer can 
have the sustainability in terms of the joint venture, if this joint venture uh, like break, and then whether the single company or the local company can be really sustained with the knowledge they get when they were in uh, joint venture. So if you can elaborate that. Mm. I'm Brenda from Option A. I'm from Argentina. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your interesting presentation. Um, I would like to ask you two questions. Uh, the first one is, um, you have mentioned many factors that are important for the successful uh, transfer of knowledge. I would like to know which ones you consider more important. Uh, and I would also like to ask you about uh, joint ventures uh, that are in developed countries, but that are, are um, north-south companies, and what are the characteristics of knowledge transfer, if you... Sorry, can you repeat that last one? Uh, yes, the case of joint ventures, but not in a developing country, but a developed country, but there, there are uh, a north-south... Between north, two south, yeah, Between a developed and a developing... Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. And if you have studied about it, and if the characteristics of the knowledge transfer uh, are different, in this setup. yes, in this. Me too. Or no? <laughs> um, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I'm Luisa from Option A. Um, my question is, um, in terms of learning and upgrading outcomes and positive uh, effects, and also in terms of disadvantages, um, how do you compare the participation of companies of, um, from, from developing countries in joint ventures and their participation in global, global value chains? Um, You will see. Okay, shall we? Oh, uh, finished? Oh, yeah. I think if you, you can take Carmen's yeah. question and then we take the last one. I don't know, maybe I, I think you should, if you want to, I mean, not to finish too late, you should group all the questions because some of them will okay. probably. Okay. Be and then and Carmen, and Ryan, and Emmanuel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, it, no, for me, it might be interesting to listen to Everyone. as many as. Yeah. <laughs> there is no guarantee I will answer. But, uh, <laughs> at least I listen. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, my name is Carmen. I'm from Option B. That's macro and finance. And uh, I have, ah, I'm German, and I have two questions. Um, one is uh, regarding the labor market and employment in Tunisia. Um, say before the Arab Spring, uh, because the educational system in Tunisia was pretty much coined by the French one as a sort of post-colonial uh, structure. Um, and one reason for the Arab Spring was, was that uh, high rates of youth unemployment. So my question would be, can these joint ventures fill the supply side gap uh, in terms of jobs um, in Tunisia? Uh, that's the first question. And the second question, um, uh, is concerning power balance or imbalance. Um, you had mentioned that, for example, the high increased size of a um, local partner increases the, uh, the power balance. Um, I had heard a seminar last year on government-led projects with, um, with the Northern uh, African region, where it was very straightforward that in most um, uh, developmentalist infrastructure projects, most often the northern partners are still more um, powerful, they are more people in, in mere numbers, and they still rather have to, to go um, in terms of uh, the, the managing the project. So uh, in terms of an independent uh, development of Tunisia, uh, what sort of um, mode would you prefer? Would it always be a joint venture coming up from the from the private enterprises, or would a government uh, uh, work, shared work, uh, be yeah. desirable? Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm Ryan Woodgate from Option B, um, which yeah, is macro and finance, and. As such, I guess a lot of the content um, is new for me, 
and also the methodology, and that's what my question pertains to. Um, this lexical intensity, I think yes. you called it, yeah. um, is new to me, and I thought um, I could just ask if you could uh, perhaps elaborate on this methodology mm -hmm. and how it captures knowledge flows, um, and perhaps if there are any shortcomings, shortcomings to it. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Hello, I thank you for your presentation. I promise I'll try to be brief. Um, you are who? So you mentioned the negotiation power between, sorry? Who are you? Ah, option A, also finance, <laughs> B. I didn't I say? No. Ah, sorry, <laughs> Julian. Okay, I didn't hear anything. So, <laughs> uh, <ne> <laughs> also where? <laughs> Where okay, from? Argentina. <laughs> so, okay, uh, that's enough. <laughs> may I? That's the no, question. No, 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 no go ahead. <laughs> so you mentioned negotiation power affects the knowledge transfer process. Does it also affect which kind of knowledge is going to be transferred in these joint ventures? And which kind of? Which kind of specific knowledge is going to be transferred? And for example, what about the desirability of this knowledge that is being transferred? Because this joint venture um, knowledge transfers can be seen as a device for financialization in developing countries, for instance. For the can you repeat the last, last As word? a device for financialization in developing ah. countries or ah. teaching okay. them how to do tax evasion and stuff. In other words. <laughs> My name is Jinani Shuer. And I am from Bahrain. Sorry. Okay. Then. <laughs> uh, I'm from Bahrain. Yes. Uh, and uh, I think what uh, today the joint seminar was very, very, very insightful and very deep. It's like I agree with every point you are mentioning. However, if I'm a researcher and I want to do a field work about this uh, knowledge transfer as uh, in the joint venture, and when I was looking at it, it was so complex for me, and it was like how I understand the topic. Specifically, you are dealing with many literature, and it's very complex. So, for example, I have a question. I have a foreign com I have a, the national company in oil and gas, mm. and I have the foreign company, okay? And they are so, you have the foreign, you have the national, and then they have a joint venture between them. Okay, and as you said, it's all, uh, it's always important that the knowledge has been transferred from the bottom. It's not from the top, and I totally agree with it. But if I'm researching and I want to see how it, how it goes, how can I understand this whole complex dynamic? It's very difficult, and mm. I'm just asking for you to just see how it goes with you as your experience. And I think one of the most important thing that you did is the methodology you are using. I don't know about this methodology, but I, I'm really, really, really like appreciate this using anthropology point of view to understand how it goes. And I think it's very important. So I would like also, I think Ryan asked about it. So I would like also to ask more about it. Thank you. OK, shall we? Yes. My name is um, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Yes, I'm from Nigeria. I wanted to ask some questions, but I will uh, illustrate uh, with the uh, situation uh, in Nigeria. Uh, the first point is w the problem of uh, unemployed uh, resources. Let's assume knowledge is being transferred. Like, for instance, all uh, developed countries, there are hundreds of brilliant uh, Nigerians, uh, engineering students that will be sponsored by a Nigerian government to come and study oil and gas. So when they return back, because of the uh, inappropriate joint ventures with Shell, Chevron, all, th all that, they are not employed. So there is problem of unemployed. So yes, there is knowledge transfer. Mm. But there is the problem of unemployed uh, resources. So that would make me to also ask the question of local content. What is the uh, influence of uh, local content in, uh, in this uh, joint venture, in this uh, Tunisia case? Mm -hmm. Then the last is the um, exit strategy. Because of, the, because of the markets of oil in Nigeria, they, sh they are developed uh, companies from a developed country they prefer to continue to have to gain access to the market. So there's no clear strategy and no clear uh, local content. What can you say to this? 
No, no, sorry, can you read the last one? The There's no clear yeah. is strategy. Like that of the uh, Suzuki Maruti. Mm. There was a clear is strategy in the exchange of shares. Okay, uh, Maruti would have 70% share in, in 2001 and I know that. Mm. Okay, I think we have uh, gone. That's all. Uh, last one. Uh, hello, my name I is Victoria. At eight o'clock. Oh, sorry. No problem. <laughs> yes. My name is Victoria. I'm from Russia, from option A. And I would like you to ask um, uh, about the strategies of companies who actually prefer to have the knowledge secret, um, specifically about the companies closed software companies, um, closed source software companies who prefer to, who like to collaborate with um, companies which have open software, uh, but they prefer to keep all the code secret and actually they would like to extract the ideas from others but to not, gev to, not to give e everything from the um, codes. So, of course, they motivate, they finance these companies, they uh, give some research platforms, but um, they are absolutely clear about it. We, we do not want to share our knowledge. And another example is about collaboration in automotive sector due to the introduction of some disruptive technologies in robotics, in um, um, hardware, software as well. Um, and the collaboration between the, um, the car makers. For example, if General Motors cooperates with um, Renault, um, how do you think um, these collaborations have a uh, future? Because this is not, you know, um, com it's not collaboration, it's more collaboration and competition. What do you think about the future of such uh, projects? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Collaboration, competition. Okay. I don't know whether I am going to handle all that. <laughs> ten, ten minutes? Ten, two minutes? Ten. ten. Ah, okay. Okay, let's try. Let's try it because I. Uh, some are very interesting questions which I. Um, so sorry if I if it is not on the right one. Uh, question from uh, Bangladesh. That's right from. Um, Yes, it's uh, an important issue. The how uh, does it make it sustainable? Well, first of all, uh, it can be sustainable. Uh, you must realize that some of the joint ventures, yeah. uh, we have 22 years, some have 35 years, 40 years, Sony Ericsson, 45. So there are ways of making it sustainable and not uh, simply uh, something which is going to break. And I think we're back to what we said uh, in those columns. Uh, the whole issue is to say why, why, what makes knowledge flow successful. If knowledge flow is successful and that knowledge flow allows capabilities and competencies to be built within the joint venture and particularly uh, joint venture in relation to the local, local firm, because that is the important, is the local firm. If, if that low, uh, joint venture is interactive learning between the local firm and the joint venture, which means you have capacity built within the joint venture, but you have also capacity built within the local partner. Okay? If that process of interactive learning and capacity building goes on in a satisfactory way, then you have, every, you have a win-win situation. If you can make it win-win situation between all three, because often uh, this uh, joint venture is, of, it is made not only uh, for the local market, and uh, I, I don't know whether you read the paper, one aspect of the strategy is to address a third market. Uh, you are a joint venture, uh, more or less what the automotive uh, industry is doing in Morocco. I mentioned Maghreb. Uh, doing, they are building cars, but only 15% of the cars are to the local market. Uh, 85 are to be exported for the rest of Africa. Then as long as that, that economic equation goes on, and then that will be... But not only in economic terms. That is what we are going to say in our paper. Econ only if it was only economic motivations, that it can be break. Because if, if, if Peugeot or Renault find uh, a suitable partner elsewhere, well, from within one year or so, can pack up and go elsewhere and joint venture goes without leaving anything, if it is only the. What we are saying that joint venture to be uh, sustainable and to be uh, successful 
has to address the knowledge transfer and building capacity, which you haven't uh, said. And building capacity, of course, is trans transferring codified and tacit knowledge. And mostly tacit knowledge than codified knowledge. Then, so you, okay, so make it sustainable, it's, you have to look it at various angles. Building trust, building partnership in a win-win situation, and uh, of course making it economically profitable to all, all parties. In other words, the local partner, the joint venture itself, and the foreign partner. Okay, that's the only uh, answer I can. Uh, and um, in that sense, uh, the cost of withdrawing from the, the cost of withdrawing from joint venture will be uh, prohibitive because there is so much involvement into, capita into competence building, into knowledge, and also because of the parent company is giving but also taking. Parent company is also learning from, now we are back to the learning economy. What we said, the learning doesn't occur only at management, it can throughout. And that capacity of being improving the knowledge of the parent company through the experience built by the joint venture and the local partner is a guarantee that it will go on. Okay? And not only if you look at it in the traditional way that is making so much profit, then of course, if it is only making such much profit, if profit is meta in Bangladesh, so we leave North Africa and we go to Bangladesh. Uh, the learning, uh, yes, the knowledge transfer, first, particularly the one uh, on learning is very uh, Interesting. I think, uh, uh, I think uh, what you said, in fact, in your uh, question is uh, uh, the, the power game. Is, who is somebody from our, uh, the power game which goes into uh, the learning, uh, the, the joint venture? Uh, we you? Uh, I haven't, uh, because I didn't hear the names, but uh, you, you, I think you, you raised okay. two questions. Okay. No, no. I, I was I was interested in the second question, which is the uh, uh, you asked one about the. Sorry, can you can you just repeat? Yes, about the, the joint ventures in developed countries that participate North South companies. But I thought the whole setup was uh, uh, this is the, the the very heart of, of our yes, research. No, but, but I. Uh, When the joint venture is located in developed countries, uh, you mean the partner uh, company is? You have two two two, uh, yes. two companies. Mm. We haven't looked at that di dimension. Must admit, but I suspect that the uh, you will find more or less similar, because the the only difference here is that maybe the. Uh, um, uh, the, the, the difference, the gap in knowledge, because there are some work, but we haven't done this work, but there's some work produced on the north-north transfer of knowledge uh, in joint venture setup. Okay? But this is where, where the, uh, I think this is where the global value chain comes. There's a lot of joint venturing going on uh, between uh, two, uh, two partners from the south. Uh, all, all, there is the ranking of, uh, you know, there is a yearly ranking which are the best 10 joint ventures in the world. I don't know whether you are aware of it. And this year, uh, the 10 best companies joint ventures, mostly all of them, but one, are, are from the north. So the joint ventures which are performing, which are sustainable, high making high rate of profit, are mostly from the north. There's only one which is there. Uh, Strangely enough, it's in the oil and gas from Saudi Arabia, and, uh, which, uh, which is ranked among the 10 best joint venture in the world, in terms of the ranking of this, of this year, 2017. Hmm? And a uh, uh, US company. The, the, uh, I can give you the name. You, cou you could see it in uh, my paper. No, not Aramco. No, 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 no. It's on the derivative of oil, not not the oil explorations. No, no, derivative. It's so. Uh, uh, 
I think what, what is interesting uh, for us is uh, when you have uh, two different companies which are uh, which the, where the level of cap competencies and access of knowledge is so different. Because the joint ventures working between two developed companies, it's business as usual. It's making business, going in partnership, doing alliances. And that is different setup. What is interesting is how, what happened when you have from different sources of knowledge. One is supposedly very advanced knowledge, and the other one, which is from the South, which hasn't got that, that kind of knowledge. So in that, that case, I think all things to do with uh, competence building, uh, with make it sustainable, with developing, uh, developing managerial, technical, and all the things that we have mentioned, all the 18 variables, becomes relevant, but we may not need 18 variables to explain the knowledge trans transfer when it, when it is. So you have to uh, review the problematics and reduce to uh, the... Because if we're two companies which are in a, already in a win-win situation, uh, it's business as usual. There is no... Uh, except there is what you have to perhaps look at is uh, what sort of global value chain they are in. How does the, the here global value chain comes into it in a big, big way? How does it complement each other? Are they uh, working uh, uh, as a joint venture to uh, launch a new, totally new product with a new technology, new advanced technology? This is usually the case what bring, bro, brings them to be uh, in a joint venture setup. Okay, so I, I, I think we are in a different problematics altogether. Uh, and the indirectly, I answered the the answer the question the GVC global value chain, or somebody answered yeah, the global value chain. What what you are saying? It's because the, yeah, uh, what you are saying. In fact, the the setup can not work as we thought it would if we introduce the power game into it, the politics of it. Yeah, the politics into it is is a key issue into the uh, joint venture. But uh, here again, the, 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 the power game is, the, is, is, is something which, which plays anyhow. We, haven't, we deliberately uh, ruled it out to, to leave because sometimes when you, s you and integrate the power game, then you are st stuck with the power issue and you forget that there the, the are other elements. But the power game is to do also with the capacity to negotiate. Power game is, is there, but how to overcome <coughs> the power game? Capacity, develop capacities to in negotiating uh, with the foreign partner, northern partner, to allow uh, technology to flow uh, and to develop uh, some joint business which is profitable to, to both of them. Because the power game is, is something which is constantly being uh, being used in, in that setup, in the joint venture. Constantly. It's not only, as I said, uh, the power game is not only uh, the, the, the equity. The power game is not equity. Equity is something. And some person raised, I think you raised, the issue of equity. Equity is one aspect. But equity is uh, at least is codified. Because equity, you say, well, you have such a such percentage of, of the capital. And those are your rights. It is codified, <laughs> and the power game is codified in equity. When it comes to, to, to explicit uh, knowledge, but when it comes to tacit knowledge and where you draw the line, then you have here to, to negotiation is part of the game. Negotiation, but also building, <laughs> what you said, negotiating power, and of course, ability to uh, negotiate uh, and to, to build mutual trust between the, uh, the parties. So the power game is balanced, on one hand, you have the power game. And on the other hand, it is balanced uh, by uh, all these uh, factors we have seen. But the, the same issue uh, is addressed when you have in GVC. Exact, exactly. You have always uh, somebody who tries to, over, to rule the, the chain, value chain. But there are people who manage to access to technology, develop that technology in an autonomous way, in spite of somebody the, uh, being uh, politically powerful in that in that in that uh, in that uh, branch or in that activity. Look at Brazil. I, I, in Brazil, uh, last year I think he presented Petrobras 
here, uh, looking at GVC. Brazil, uh, about what, 40 years ago, Brazil was in a very weak in terms of uh, capacity to negotiate with the big bosses of uh, oil and gas equipment. Okay, if he could have said, the Brazilian could have said, okay, they are so powerful, we are going to be only consumers and use whatever they, gi they give us, they can give us. No, I mean, the Brazilians uh, worked out on a strategy which is uh, cooperation and competition. Somebody mentioned it but in a very tactful way, okay? So they managed, and this is another paper, another contribution, you can uh, read it. They managed to build confidence, they managed to allow those powerful companies to uh, go into a win-win game and not to block the transfer. To the extent they started as being uh, users, consumers of oil equipment. And 20 years later, 25, they are competitors. They are producers in, uh, in certain components of the oil equipment. They are second in the world in drills. How did they uh, get out of the power game? They get out of the power game by negotiating, by building confidence, uh, by reminding that it is a win-win game situation. So I think the power game is has to be strategically addressed through knowledge through one of the aspects is the engineering, which I haven't addressed here, because this, this brings me uh, to a question, but what type of knowledge? Yes, it's important also to, uh, you may have a, a kind of a, a very collaborative attitude in the joint venture when it comes to certain type of knowledge. I suppose, or what is um, the managerial law knowledge uh, knowledge about finance, accounting, about management of human resources. There's some kind of knowledge where uh, transfer is of knowledge is uh, easily done as long as you don't go to the, uh, the heart of what is uh, the heart of the business, which is a, uh, the patented uh, knowledge, which is uh, the result of long investment in R&D, which, the, of course, this kind of knowledge will not be find it transferred in the same way as you would find management of a human resources, okay? So it depends also what type of knowledge. So we have, I think we have to, in our next stage, next study, we have to incorporate this issue, which is important you raised, on what kind of knowledge. Can we talk about the same way if we are talking of one type, one other type of knowledge? No situation is different. So uh, here again. And uh, there, I think uh, you are right, uh, definitely right, that the, uh, the knowledge, uh, the power game is dependent on the kind of knowledge. Okay, and collaboration and competition are also dependent on the kind of knowledge. Uh, education system. Um, yes, it is, it is a key issue education, of course. If you, uh, youth employment, as you can see, as, as you well uh, said, is one of the hard issue now, not only in Tunisia, but in the whole region, because of rate of birth, because of the, uh, the machine, the, the industrial and economic machine is not producing uh, employment uh, to that, to the extent where it should. And we are talking in terms of by the year 2025, around 20 million uh, people coming new into the labor market. 25 is the tomorrow. 20 million people coming to ask for employment, youth. So we really are facing, they are facing a very important issue. Uh, now, pretending that joint ventures can, can solve the problem, no, unfortunately not. That's not... Uh, because, uh, first of all, um, the joint venture mostly were we looked at f with private concerns. Private concerns is really making profit. How you make profit and the employment is, although they have been creating employment, of course, uh, some, some concerns have been producing uh, up to 1,000 employment in the automotive industry. Uh, we haven't looked at this case, actually. Uh, it's something I've done as well. 
uh, produce things, uh, but not to the extent that they will uh, they will solve the the uh, uh, because it, it the the, the uh, what Tunisia uh, put forward as one of the major objectives of joint ventures is diversification and exports because it's not uh, it hasn't got access to got <laughs> it hasn't got access to mineral resources so uh, the, the more added value is, is through uh, diversification not so and uh, indeed uh, Joint venture has to be uh, perhaps the one of the questions, yes, how could joint venture contribute to, to this objective of reducing or addressing the unemployment issue? What should be reviewed in the uh, joint venture setup as it is now to address this question? But it is, it is important that, we, that all sorts of businesses address the issue of unemployment. Uh, government-led projects uh, in the region, they are not producing that many jobs either. Two, because there is, one is because there are not that many because of the crisis. They have to cut short, to cut down their expenses in terms of structure drastically in the last three or four years. So what happened after the Arab Spring, the foreign debts rocketed again. It was going down, but then up again, and Tunisia is back into independence. So the, uh, major infrastructure, new uh, dams and things postponed. So the prospect of uh, just government, it is something which is a mix, I think, of government projects, of uh, giving more confidence to the private capital, domestic private capital. This is where the key issue lies. Because we see that a lot of capital flight is going on in Tunisia. People are investing in the Gulf countries, investing in Canada. So, so now the current problem is uh, how to get, not joint ventures, but the private capital to do things. Uh, two minutes, what can I, in minutes. <laughs> I'm sorry, we had all very interesting questions, but uh, no, uh, I think on lexical um, intensity, I probably uh, raised as many questions uh, as you. We, we used it for the first time. We, we, it works very well when it comes to uh, linguistics, when it comes to social anthropological studies. It has given its proof. But this is a risk we have taken to, to use it. We, we think it has given some uh, interesting results. And uh, we are now submitting our paper to, uh, to a review, to a journal. If it is accepted, then it is a good review. <laughs> but it is something which, uh, uh, there are more details in the paper if you want to, uh, okay? But uh, if you, yes, please go and, uh, and uh, use it because it has got very, very interesting results and it answers the, uh, okay? Will be in a way, uh, yeah, we will be in a way able to exchange if you want with uh, the Kader. Uh, Please, uh, there is my email. If you mail me some of the questions again, I will be happy to uh, to to answer them. But uh, um, vacation for him too uh, since tonight. So <laughs> That's right. I wish you very good vacation so for everybody. Christmas. Merry Christmas for everybody. Thank. Have a great winter break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much.